and this episode I would appreciate if we can come down a little. Um, my name is Godwin Wobu, I come from the part of the world where you have titles like Professor and Professor Mrs, Doctor and Doctor Mrs, Chief and Chief Mrs, but I'm going to disappoint you this night. I'm Mr. Godwin C. Wobu. Godwin is the one graduating the political leadership. I was just 17 years old and a college student of the university when a commitment for leadership development hit me. It hit me so strong that I took a piece of paper, carried a carbon sheet, and ran to a friend of mine who's an artist. His name is Kirechi Onike. And I said, Can you quick, 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 quick? Represent the thought of a great Nigeria and a great Africa in this commercial. Put that on that. My first partner for this great job, really, is Kim Lagos Corey. She saw the future and is excited to invest in the future. Today, I want to honor her for such a value of sacrifice. question that I would ask all of you is simply what if are you holding hostage in our community because of your personal needs? What is it that you are not doing that God has sent you here to do because you're scared? The very idea of leadership confronts very big challenges, big opportunities and big possibilities. As a man you know very well would like to say, this is huge. <laughs> so huge. <laughs> so, from the political ferment in the United States, today in the era of Donald Trump, to the stunning victory of Emmanuel Macron, response to yearnings of his countrymen in France for decisive and bold leadership. From the shifts in the electoral, in the electoral map in the United Kingdom in the era of Brexit, to the political crisis in Brazil over allegations of corruption in its leadership. Leadership is the big issue. For good or ill, we live in its shadow. And we can understand why. Because in all its ramifications, political, corporate, entrepreneurial, innovation, healthcare and public policy, and so on, leadership is the main determinant of economic and social problems. We're going to move fast so that we can hand the mic over to the next people. And I want to introduce this topic by saying that most of us have participated in various political processes, either as voters or contestants. And um, if you are like me, we, you voted, I've never contested. So either voted along political lines, or you voted for candidates that you like, or if you're like me, you vote for a candidate that has the best suit. <laughs> but something has always been, uh, it strikes me, it strikes me how immediately after the election, the entire country collapses into one party. And that's the party that I call the Complainant People's Congress, CPC. That's where you have people complaining about the party or the political party or about the candidate they have voted in. So we're going to have the, car, the panel here tonight to discuss and help us to get out of that party which uh, don't become complainants or remain complainants any longer. So I'm introducing Miss Remy Doyle. Did I get the name right? Doyle, sorry about that. And she's the president and CEO of Image Consulting Group. 
Mr. Charles H. Depot the Third, the Vice President Programs National Black Chambers of Commerce. I have Mr. Debayo Ido, Minister Head of Economic Section Embassy of Nigeria, Washington, D.C. You're welcome, sir. Ambassador C. Stevenson McGann, retired founder of the Stevenson Group. And Safar Rab II, CEO, Intercultural Incorporated. Do we have him around? Good. I'm going to start up with Ambassador C. Stevenson Magan to help us to understand what is political oh, leadership. I think I was asked to speak first only because I have the time to ask. I guess I'll have to work a lot harder and I'll speak louder. You know, the previous speakers were very inspirational. I think, however, that in the brief time that I have with my comments, to be a bit more vocational. Vocational in the sense that I think we need to have a clear roadmap, a pedestrian way forward in understanding what we mean by economic growth and development in Africa. And I speak of Africa in generic terms. As you all know, Africa is a continent, not a country. However, I'm quite sure that some of my comments uh, over the next couple of minutes uh, will be reflective of conditions in not just Nigeria or South Africa, but throughout the continent. First of all, political leadership must move towards sustainable models of governance that are based on rule of law. We can no longer have arbitrary systems in place. As a result, I believe it's necessary to move Africa away from centralized models of governance to more decentralized models of governance. What do I mean by that? State, provincial, and local governments need to be strengthened and enhanced. Decentralized systems allow for mechanisms to be put in place that allow for regulation of dispensation of resources at local levels. These mechanisms tend to diminish the impact of corruption and nepotism, which plagues which plays our leadership problems. In concert, they move toward private sector economic growth models that require only monitoring and regulation rather than oversight and manipulation. Secondly, when we talk about economic growth and development in Africa, we should be addressing critical needs rather than artificial priorities. From my perspective, we need to focus on key areas, obviously defense and security, agribusiness, environmental mitigation, water and waste management, supply chain security, power generation. We have to be quite specific in identifying the key models of development to move forward. As it was said time and time again, the mechanisms exist. The problem is the proper use of these mechanisms. And so, we have four other panelists, but I just wanted us to focus on that there are concrete steps that we have to take, which are perhaps, as I said earlier, vocational in nature. That is great to have vision, but we have to focus on implementation. We have to look at what are the strategies that are operationally correct that benefit the greater amount of people. That benefit is based on an equitable dispensation of resources based on a decentralized system that allows local development primarily through state and provincial governments rather than centralized federal governments. And with that, I'll conclude my comments. Thank you so much, Ambassador Stevenson. Um, I'll hand the mic over to another um, well, you're not an ambassador, but you are close to ambassadors. Uh, my good friend who works at the embassy, Mr. Adebayo Itomu, my question to you, what are the qualities of a good leader? You can use this mic, I think. Thank you very much. <coughs> Dr. Mogal has done a, quite a lot of work in his uh, opening remarks in this area. 
But uh, looking at uh, Africa and uh, Nigeria, particularly my country, I think there are some qualities that uh, have been lacking in our political life. Such qualities as a, a good, uh, a, a passion for service. You must have a passion for service. Apart from a passion for service, you must have the requisite discipline to transform goals on paper into uh, achievements on the field. I think one of the things uh, that Nigeria is noted for is passion of very good plans. But carrying out those plans to its logical conclusion and affecting the life of the people has been a, a huge uh, challenge. Of course, uh, we, we know that uh, Africa has a, a peculiar problem of uh, uh, corruption. And uh, even though governments are attempting to tackle it, uh, much uh, still needs to be done in that area. Of course, there is also the problem of lack of vital institutions. If people without the requisite uh, qualities get into positions of power, the institutions are there, say, for example, in a place like the United States, to sort out whether the party or the individual and to uh, put the person uh, to conform. But those institutions are still very weak in Africa, and we need to do a lot uh, to develop them. Also, uh, discipline is, I will re-emphasize again, because this is one thing that has affected most of our uh, political discourse and activities in Nigeria more than any other thing. We need, to, we need to have the discipline to say, even when this uh, policy does not go well with me personally or with my sectional uh, interest, I can still allow it to go ahead in the community spirit. So these are some of the brief comments that I would like to make at, at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Saido. With the Western time, we're going to allow what I want to do is just to run through, then I will allow a time for Q&A. So, please allow us just to, we have just 20 minutes, we have to move very fast. I'm gonna hand the mic over to Remy Dele. Um, I hope the mic is working over there. I can bring my mic over there. And my question to you is, how, is it working? No. Okay. How can we develop political followership? We talk about leadership. But you're not going to make a good leader if you don't have good active followers. So, how can we develop active, responsible followership, especially in Africa? Hi, my name is Remy Duyele, the president and CEO of Image Consulting Group. We specialize in human capital development. And five years ago, I had the privilege of working in Nigeria for five years in government. And that opened my eyes after living here for over 20 something years. I was privileged, called to serve and serve for five years. And that gave me an inside information to what leadership is all about. By show of hands, how many of you count yourself as uh, political leaders in this room? Any, any politicians? No. See, that's where the problem is. <laughs> that is a problem. We all have an element of politicking in us. And of course, the reason why you didn't raise your hands, you were probably thinking about the negative connotation that political influence brings, but that shouldn't be. Even in our homes, we play politics. We have three kids, they expect different things, so you have to wear different hats. So we have to change our mindset to what does politics mean to us? Because if we don't know the true meaning, we're not gonna be able to understand what it is, and we're not going to be able to follow and be active. You can only follow and embrace what you like. So what I'm here to say to all of us is that as people, I understand because of the negative connotation that politics brings to us, we, don't, we, we kind of distance ourselves and we let the morons rule us. We need to get involved by first understanding what does it mean. It's just a movement to change people's lives. And if you go in there with the qualities that they told us, the great qualities, you go in there, you understand that you're there to change lives. 
then you should not distance yourself from political being a politician. So back to the question. We are saying that how do you create great followers? Followers have to, of course, know what they are following. That means that we have to get the right people in place. The right people have to be positioned. And who picks the right people? You and I. We vote those people in. Like, like the professor said, we voted our president in now. So if we're complaining, or if you didn't vote, that's your fault. Because you had the opportunity to do that. So as followers, we have to understand what is the stake at hand in whatever we choose to do or not do. And once we understand the state, we need to understand, we need to get educated. And once we get educated, get involved. And it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to get into what you don't know, the expected result. That's where competition comes. You wanna be competent. You wanna be able to collaborate. And you wanna be able to know that it's not just all about you. So for the followers, get yourself educated, get yourself competent enough to be who God has called you to be. And when you do that, you will distinguish yourself as a dynamic individual who can add value to any political system or to any course that you believe in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, she's the only one that got a round of applause here. What's going on? Um, I'm gonna give the mic to Mr. Charles H. Ball the third, right? I'm going to ask you a question. What are the challenges of political leadership in Africa? Have you talked about that? The fact that people don't have integrity. My response to that question, I just want to edify that I'm an African American. I represent an African American business organization whose mission is to economically empower through entrepreneurial pursuits throughout the diaspora. Our sustainability has become dependent upon going outside of the markets and the customers and the people that we've been enjoying doing business with since we were freed from slavery. Our own government has curtailed our opportunity that built much of the wealth of the larger black businesses in America. We were allowed to participate in doing business with the government as a result of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It was written into law. Since then, the erosion of those principles by not being enforced as laws, but more so embraced as guidelines. So with each administration, the ability and the opportunity is eroded. We've been forced to now seek these opportunities wherever we're finding African descendants. Well, the question is, what are the challenges of potential leadership in Africa? So I think we can all agree here to the facts of history that the political leadership has demonstrated an inability to accept the will of the people. By that I mean you have some leaders that may have lost an election or the questionability of their position, they refuse to leave office. There's a number of economic things that are tied to this. So let's talk about Nigeria. Nigeria is getting extensive coverage of the economic disposition. Even here in the Washington Post, it talked about the challenges of the uh, Nigerian embassy and implied a lack of support from your own government. So we have an existing reality combined with what we are seeing and learning from social media's impact and its influences, such as the Arab Spring. Thank you so much. We just have a few minutes left because I'm going to have you ask some questions. So I'm going to give the mic now to Mr. Safer, and um, you're going to be the last person to speak before we hand the mic to the, to the audience. And I want to have a, just a very simple question for you. How can we mobilize the youth? Godly is about youth leadership development and the civil society towards youth, I mean, political leadership. If you want me to be brief, you should ask me a simple 
Great question. But I'm going to be brief anyway. I'm, my name is Safir Rob, as, as was mentioned, and I want to ec echo um, just an, an idea that I heard that really jolted me when I listened to Professor Kingsley Chidu mention that the, the, the correction of thinking is the beginning of really reform for everything that we pursue, including civil society and, and engaging youth. I'm an African American who was born in Baltimore City, uh, Spalding Avenue, which is in the bowels of the ghetto, much similar to a lot of the circumstances that many young Africans on the continent are born, born into. And I think that the honesty about structural exclusion, white supremacy, and aiming to imitate that which excludes us without reconciling it properly is the key in addressing the thinking that leads to uh, the sort of reform that we want to see. I would say four, four quick points multi platform, uh, with respect to multi platform media faith, hard work, um, simple living, and high thinking. Are, are the controls that will enable us to access the youth and civil society. Thank you so much. Um, do we still have the time for questions? I can take two questions, please. Just two questions. Keep it simple. I will bring the mic over to you there. I'll, I'll leave the mic, and I appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Oh. Um, my name is Matthew Paul. I'm a retired U.S. Marshal. But look, this is my question, and I've been in the, I grew up in this community of Washington, D.C. I see some of the same things happening in Africa that happens right here in the United States when it comes down to African Americans, because we, we really got two societies in this country. So what I see, I guess the question is, how do we deal with the fear of our people? We right here in Prince George's County, I ran for, I ran for office here. The most affluent county for black Americans in the whole United States, we talk about per capita, what we make here. And we have some of most failing schools We've got, you know, all kinds of issues here that you don't see these in more affluent white neighborhoods. But when we try to get African Americans to come out, to speak out, to stand up, a lot of them are afraid.